I have the opportunity to talk about some fun things, some things that have been published, other things that have been presented, uh, and, and go through some fun concepts about how we might be able to build upon uh, the initial benefits of checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, here are my relevant disclosures. I have one additional relevant disclosure is that I'm a melanoma oncologist and checkpoint inhibitor base, so beyond checkpoints is, is going to almost always include checkpoints uh, and also um, involve melanoma studies. So this is a slide that I've updated once on March 2nd, 2019. Um, and it took me almost a whole plane ride from Boston to San Francisco to do this. Um, but what it shows in the upper left corner, as of, whoops, as of March 2nd, 2019, are all of the FDA approvals of individual drugs for individual diseases, not indications. So if, if there was an indication in metastatic melanoma in the second line, I didn't put a first line indication in. But the first time a drug was approved for a certain cancer. And the, these thicker arrows are combinations of ipilimumab and nivolumab. And so I think what's clear is it's a busy field. Um, this was ipilimumab being approved in March of 2011, uh, and then the melanoma indications for pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and then it was off to the races. And there's been this just huge explosion of, of activity, not necessarily everybody having activity, but, but enough patients to, to change the standard of care for patients with a variety of different solid tumors. And there are now three PD-1 inhibitors and three PD-L1 inhibitors that are approved for various indications. Each year, they seem to be um, a, you know, a significant number of drugs that get approved for a new indication. Uh, we're, we've now had several indications since March uh, of, of 2nd of 2019, and it's really an amazing time to be an immunotherapist. But there's an unmet need. And the unmet need uh, is based on this, that most patients are not receiving benefit. And so even in melanoma, which is the kind of poster disease for checkpoint inhibitor therapy, we have response rates of 50, I'm sorry, of 45% at best with single agent therapy. In combination, it's 60%. And at four years, we've passed the median survival so that more patients are dying than not. Um, and only about a third of our patients are having long-term continuous benefit to therapy. And that's in the best disease um, in terms of responsiveness. So we need a better therapeutic approach. Now, ways to, to address the unmet need, you've heard from Dr. Flaherty about his um, comments on, on biomarkers. So if we could better select patients, we could, we could be more effective with using checkpoint inhibitors without having any new checkpoint inhibitors approved. We were just better at figuring out who responds to PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibition. We can improve our understanding of the mechanisms of therapeutic resistance, and we can develop more effective therapies. Uh, so this first one, uh, you just got to hear from Dr. Flaherty about this, um, and to hear my uh, thoughts on this, it would be a topic for another day. So I won't, I won't um, impart any of my wisdom or, or unwisdom on this. I don't want to mess up what Dr. Flaherty just told you. Uh, we, it would be good to improve our understanding of the mechanisms of therapeutic resistance, and this is happening. Um, there are a number of potential mechanisms, both at the time that a patient is diagnosed and before you've treated them with immunotherapy, and then after initial therapy with uh, a PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor or combination response, and then uh, recurrence or, or progression. And most of these have to do with the interaction between the immune cell and the cancer cell. Um, I think one important point is any mechanism of acquired resistance can be a mechanism of intrinsic resistance. And the rationale behind that is a tumor doesn't get to be a tumor without already figuring out a way around the immune system. And so there may be 
uh, excluding T cells from the tumor. They may be excluding T cells from the tumor microenvironment. Uh, there may be, you know, those, those are pretty classic ways that a tumor can get around it. It's, it's doing something to the body or doing something to the immune microenvironment to prevent uh, its destruction. It could be um, an alternative checkpoints so that when you give a PD-1 inhibitor, it doesn't matter because there's all these other negative checkpoints uh, that are, that are uh, up and, and ready. Um, or it could be losing antigen presentation machinery. The, you know, the simplest thing a tumor cell can do when it's being attacked is just stop being recognized by the immune system. Uh, and that's been described for decades. Um, and, and that can be through loss of, of HLA, that can be through loss of beta-2 microglobulin, which loads antigen onto um, to MHC or HLA. Uh, and so there, there are just a number of, of, of mechanisms. Um, Dr. Flaherty talked about some of these. Uh, he talked about um, wind signaling. Uh, Dr. Gaynor just talked about STK11, uh, and, and that would predictably um, lead to signaling of the PR3 kinase pathway. Um, you can lose interferon signaling. Uh, and in the acquired setting, beta-2 microglobulin mutations or silencing uh, and escape mutations and interferon signaling have been the, the most um, probably talked about acquired mutations uh, that are seen. And uh, this was uh, presented or this is published um, in, a, in a few different uh, big journals about Jack mutations, uh, led by uh, Tony Ribas and his group at UCLA. Uh, we presented or and published on, um, on beta-2 microglobulin mutations associated um, with, with acquired resistance. So understanding that may be useful, uh, particularly when we are getting into the post-checkpoint inhibitor setting, to figure out maybe with an eye on why did somebody not uh, respond, or why did they respond and then, then progress uh, as, as thinking about how to apply the next generation of, of therapies um, for these patients? Uh, and then we get to talk about therapies. So um, what I would generally say is whatever we do to modify the immune environment, it'll likely be better if we give it with a PD-1 inhibitor. Just like wine is better with cheese, it's probably cheese is better than wine, because meat's better than wine too, so lots of things are better with wine. Um, or chocolate's better with peanut butter or vice versa. Or rice is better with beans or vice versa. Like all of these, and for the record, all of these were in my house. And, <laughs> and some of them are no longer in my house. They've been consumed. Um, but really what we're talking about is combination therapy. Um, single agent therapy, uh, in the, particularly when, when thinking about a next therapy for, for immune therapy, um, is probably not going to be that realistic. Um, maybe we'll find the one drug that's going to be remarkable for a certain cell population and it will truly be an immunotherapy driven um, um, mechanism. But for the most part, anything that creates uh, the immune system to be more active in a tumor will likely be better if you allow those immune effector cells um, a, a bit more access to the tumor by inhibiting PD-1 or PD-L1. And so I think I'm going to, even though I'm about seven minutes into my talk, rename my talk. Instead of beyond checkpoints, I'll call it in combination with checkpoints. And we'll just restart the whole talk right now. Okay, we won't quite do that. So fortunately, I don't have to pay a fee every time I put the slide up to Ira Melman um, uh, and Dan Chen. Um, and it's a beautiful slide. It's a beautiful picture of showing the way that the tumor and the immune system dance um, and, and cycle. And, and there's release of antigens from tumor cells. Even if the tumor is thriving, that's still going to happen. Um, and there's antigen presentation. These antigen presentation, presenting cells make it to uh, either a lymph, lymph node or regional lymph structure. They prime and activate T cells. Those T cells have to make their way back in. They have to recognize the cancer cells. They have to kill cancer cells, and it goes on and on and on. And a number of, the, uh, of very common um, therapies, both common immune therapies that are FDA approved, like oncolytic viruses, um, are, you can kind of put where they might be functioning here, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, which are the classic 
uh, targeting the classic checkpoint on immune priming and activation. Viruses may do something here, uh, PD-1, and, and there may be even CTLA-4 effects on T regulatory cells. So, so this, this is a nice way of, of looking at the various types of things we could add to PD-1 inhibitors. And so chemotherapy, radiation therapy, the targeted therapies, and, and when I refer to targeted therapies, I'm basically talking about oncogenic targeted therapies. Uh, oncolytic viruses all kind of function here. Um, I'll just go through it because I, I messed up my, my slide sequence. I'm sorry about that. Um, but you'll see what, you've already heard Dr. Gao talk, but I'm going I'm to guess at one of the things he might have talked about. Um, antigen presentation, we got the stuff for that, and, and you're going to hear a little bit from Dr. Ott tomorrow about personalized cancer vaccines. Um, you already heard uh, from Dr. Gao, I would imagine, about the combination of, of uh, anti-angiogenic therapies plus PD-1 inhibitors. Um, you're going to hear tomorrow from Dr. Leake about adoptive cell therapies. Uh, and you probably heard from Dr. Cohen this morning about the combination of anti ctla 4 uh, plus uh, PD-1 inhibitor. So these are now all just combining things that are already FDA approved with PD-1 inhibitors and demonstrating benefit uh, when used in combination. Uh, and some that are novel therapies, the vaccines, the adoptive cell therapies are obviously uh, more novel therapies that are, that are and potentially standalone therapies. Okay. So what I'm going to cover in, in the rest of my time is, is to walk through some of the data with a few other therapies. So I mentioned oncolytic virus therapies, and I'm going to talk more specifically about the, the role of oncolytic viruses uh, in some of the data in combination with checkpoint inhibitors in melanoma. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about chemotherapy combinations, uh, to, that which we alluded to a little bit before in the discussion. It was a perfect segue, Dr. Cobalt. Um, I'll talk about BRAF targeted therapies specifically as, as a model of, of onco, onco, you know, targeting um, oncogenes uh, in combination with PD-1 inhibitors. And then we'll talk a little bit about PI3 kinase gamma uh, and HDAC inhibition in combination. So what about combination therapy? Uh, this is uh, a remarkable slide that I uh, borrowed from Omid Hamid, who probably borrowed it from somebody else. Um, which was, it's a little outdated, but, but it, it, it gives a little bit of an example of how many combination trials are out there for cancer. This is probably 2016 or 2017. If you were to do the 2019, it would just be all black with words and letters because there are so many clinical trials looking at combination therapies uh, in, in, with the PD-1 inhibitors. And, and again, I think most of what we, we should be doing is thinking about where on this wheel this cycle our therapies are affecting because it might help us understand which therapies may be more effective in certain scenarios. And so we'll come back to this um, and start with cytotoxic therapy. So I, I alluded to it a little bit uh, before in, in the, the last question uh, in, in the discussion, but chemotherapy has a lot of effects. The, we tend to, the classical thinking of chemotherapy is it poisons cells a little bit more than it poisons people, uh, you know, cancer cells a little bit more than it poisons the, 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 the host. And if you can just kill enough cancer cells and keep the person alive, all is going to be well. And it's really a, a, a dose effect um, and, and it's a therapeutic window. And these are the concepts that really are the most important when thinking about whether chemotherapy is going to work. That's probably mostly BS. Chemotherapy probably works and cures people in the cancers that it cures when it can eradicate enough tumor cells um, to allow the immune system to take care of the rest of the tumor cells. And even better, it may actually create uh, immunologic cell death uh, in certain situations. Um, and, and when it does, that immunologic cell death is probably more, much more likely to be associated with a more durable benefit. Uh, than just um, killing some cells because uh, they either apoptose or, or necrose. So some of the features that have been described with chemotherapy, um, certainly you can put some, some stress on those tumor cells and lead to antigen presentation. 
um, PD and PD-1 expression, and that may be interferon driven, that may, there may be other cytokines are involved that are driving that. Uh, there can be effects on um, immunosuppressive cytokines, there can be effects on myeloid elements, T regulatory elements. So, so when, when you kind of begin to dive into the literature of the effects of chemotherapy on immune microenvironment, it's quite rich. The first time I looked at this, I was actually really surprised. Like, holy cow, these things might actually work in combination with, with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and that was a very astute prediction, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you very much. So this is some data with chemotherapy plus anti-PD-1 and PD-1 therapy in patients with non-small cell lung cancer. So um, this is pembrolizumab combinations versus placebo and non-squamous and then in squamous. And basically, this is not progression-free survival. This is not response rate. This is not time to next therapy. This is overall survival. That uh, you live longer uh, if you received chemotherapy plus PD-1 inhibitor than if you received chemotherapy in both squamous and non-squamous. Um, and then this is another example of that. The chemo arm here is carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. Um, and so the, um, the, the experimental arm here is atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, carboplatin. Car carbop carboplatin and paclitaxel. I'm a melanoma doctor. I don't use enough chemotherapy to be able to pronounce them any, anymore. <laughs> and if you look at um, meta-analyses of a number of different studies, it's clear that chemotherapy combinations um, are favored uh, in, in most of these trials, if not all of them. Um, and, and it's really, this is the first example uh, of definitive phase three trials proving that if, if you're going to just compare with chemotherapy, uh, you should give, if you just want to give chemotherapy, you should rethink that and give it with a PD-1 or pd one inhibitor. And that's not just uh, in, um, in non-small cell lung cancer. This is extensive stage small cell, um, and this is chemotherapy or atezolizumab plus chemotherapy. Again, um, overall survival advantage to giving chemotherapy um, uh, with PD-1 inhibitor, or this is the PD-L1 inhibitor versus not. Uh, and this is triple negative breast cancer. There's a comment about triple negative breast cancer during the panel discussion. And this is data that, that shows um, atezolizumab plus NAB paclitaxel versus NAB paclitaxel plus placebo. This ultimately led to the approval of this combination in women with triple negative breast cancer. Uh, and if you look at the pd one positive subgroups, um, that's where you see most of, of the benefit to the, to the point of the question, which was, how, you know, how do we deal with pd one testing? It's clearly a relevant biomarker uh, in, in some scenarios um, and more in some scenarios than others. Um, so that's chemotherapy. So there's clearly, there's, there's a, a biological rationale for why we would give, give chemotherapy with PD-1, pd one inhibitors. Uh, and there's now definitive clinical trial data to support its use in certain scenarios. So what about MAP kinase-targeted therapy? So uh, the initial um, data with trying to understand the effects of BRAF-targeted therapy on, on melanoma um, was done at MGH and led by Jen Wargo before she defected to Houston and MD Anderson. I don't hold it against her. Um, I kind of hold it against her, but she's, the, she's great. Uh, and brilliantly identified that single agent BRAF inhibitor led to increased antigen expression. Um, it also seemed to not have a major effect on the function of the T cells and may have even made them a little bit more active. And so we built upon those findings by looking at our patient samples. Uh, and these were patients with BRAF mutated melanoma who were being treated with frontline BRAF targeted therapy, either single agent BRAF inhibitor, typically vemurafenib at the time, or combination therapy, typically with dibrafenib and trametinib. And what we found was that there was increased antigen expression. Again, that was what was modeled in the cell lines. Um, there was decreased immunosuppressive cytokine production. There was increased CD8 T cell infiltration. Um, there was increased T cell clonality. Uh, with, the, with the treatment, 
of BRAF inhibitor therapy, and there was increased PDL1 expression. Interestingly, none of these individual features were associated with better outcome to the BRAF inhibitor therapy, but almost all of these would be predicted to, to lead to better outcome if you were being treated with a PD-1 inhibitor. And it wasn't long before this made its way into the clinic. And so the, one of the first trials that we worked on um, with, check, with, with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition was uh, a trial of vemurafenib, covimetinib, and tezolizumab. Initially, uh, we looked at vemurafenib and atezolizumab. Um, interestingly, when you started the drugs at the same time, it was completely intolerable. All three patients who were on the first cohort of vemurafenib plus atezolizumab developed either full-body rash or near-full-body rash and or um, grade 2 or 3 or 4 elevation of ALT, AST, and all of them felt terrible. They all also responded. And so in thinking about how we might be able to, to give these therapies, there was then the idea, well, maybe we can lead in with the targeted therapy, make sure they're tolerating it, and then add the, the atezolizumab, and, and that seemed to be tolerable. We looked at 56 days, then we looked at 28 days, and then it became obsolete to give PD one in, or it gave, became obsolete to give single agent BRAF inhibitors plus anything. Uh, it had to be a BRAF inhibitor plus a MEK inhibitor plus anything. Uh, and so this was the the reinvention of of this trial um, after a number of amendments was looking at cobimetinib, which is in blue, which is given three weeks in a row with a week off. That's just the standard dosing, uh, plus vemurafenib, which is given twice a day, and interestingly, the week before starting the pdl one inhib inhibitor, uh, the plan was to lower the dose, uh, and that seemed to work and allow us to get away with giving a tezolizumab. Response rates were quite good. The unconfirmed response rate was over 80 percent. The confirmed response rate uh, um, is, is now closer to, to the mid-70s percent range, um, and this is uh, a a waterfall plot, which you've probably seen today. This is a pretty good-looking waterfall plot. There's a lot of responders here, uh, pretty deep responses. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, these seem to last a while. And so even the patient who is the one of the two patients who had primary progressive disease uh, ultimately is here. And now if we follow it out in the publication that's, that's going to come out shortly, uh, he's down here. He's, we actually were able to continue to treat him, and he's done amazingly well um, on, on therapy. So um, it, it, clearly an active regimen. Um, but an active regimen in a single arm uh, of, of a trial is hard to know what to make of it. Uh, and so it would be nice if we had some randomized data. Uh, and there was some randomized data, not of that combination yet, but of a different combination that was presented at ESMO in 2018 um, by many of our colleagues. The, the presentation itself was by Paolo Ascierto. So this is the Keynote 022 study. This was a trial looking at, there was a number of cohorts looking at either MEK inhibitor plus pembrolizumab or BRAF MEK inhibitor plus pembrolizumab, uh, and then once uh, they were through the safety and a little bit of expansion, there was a randomized component of this trial. And this randomized one-to-one -one patients to pembrolizumab plus dibrafenib plus trametinib, so PD-1 plus BRAF plus MEK inhibition, uh, or a placebo plus BRAF and MEK inhibition. And this is an interesting figure. So it's interesting because the response rate is actually higher in the brown, but the depth of responses are actually higher in the green. And the way that I would state this, um, uh, kind of to continue to answer Mark's question, because your question actually is relevant for much of, of the talk, in patients who could tolerate staying on, they seem to do quite well from an efficacy standpoint. Um, but because it was intolerable for many patients, I think it, it actually limited the efficacy. Um, but as Dr. Flaherty said, you know, depth of, of response probably matters. 
And so there, there's, there could be something to all of this if just we can figure out how to give these drugs together. Um, the primary endpoint of this, uh, this sub part of this trial was progression-free survival. And though there was a numeric difference, and uh, if you're into p-values, a statistically significant difference, however, the predefined um, specificity was actually a positive, would have been a positive study if the p-value was 0 0.025 or better, which it was not. And so this did not meet the primary endpoint of the design. Interestingly, duration of response was better with the triple combination. So you're more likely to respond uh, in the brownish red. You're less likely to respond in the green. But if you responded uh, with just triplet therapy, you seem to have a more durable response. Not surprising, because there's a PD-1 inhibitor there, and we know that those responses tend to be more durable. But interesting nonetheless. And then overall survival, this is very preliminary. And if you're an optimist, there may even be separation. If you were thinking about when you would see an improvement in overall survival, it wouldn't be in the first two years uh, of a trial like this. Uh, it would actually be after that. And so I think the, the jury is still out as to whether or not those curves will ever come apart. But if they do, this is when you'd expect it to happen, not in the here, um, at least not with such an active drug regimen like dabrafenib and trametinib. Okay, so moving on. Oncolytic viruses. So oncolytic viruses um, are just what I said. They're viruses that kill cancer cells. And the, one of the, the prototype oncolytic viruses is herpes simplex virus. Uh, and if you mess around with herpes simplex virus and take out some of the um, nerve infecting components of the virus and insert in um, the production of GMCSF, you get a drug called TVEC, which is a herpes simplex 1 virus that secretes GMCSF. And, and the concept of this is you, in, you inject it into the tumor. The tumor um, gets infected uh, by the, the virus. The virus blows up cancer cells and also secretes GMCSF, which recruits dendritic cells, which then prime uh, and, and trigger um, greater T cell expansion. Uh, and then in an ideal world, uh, some of these effector T cells leave the tumor and go to another tumor uh, and, and, do, and, and get after uh, those, those tumor cells that they now are, can recognize because they've been um, generated. So does this work? Well, I'm talking about it, so it does work. Um, the trial uh, it, that, that led to the approval of TVEC was a randomized study of TVEC versus subcutaneous GMCSF. Um, this is a definition of a straw man study because GMCSF actually doesn't have any uh, real activity uh, in patients with this were metastatic or unresectable melanoma, generally with limited um, metastatic disease. Um, and this is the waterfall plot for the TVEC. So, you know, many patients are having some benefit, but a lot of patients had tremendous benefit. Um, and this is an overall survival curve that, that didn't meet statistical significance, um, but, but had a p-value of 0.51. And, and so there's a suggestion that if you gave TVAC versus giving something that doesn't work, that you might live longer. But that's not really the story with these drugs. What we've always had an eye towards is, could we use these in combination with checkpoint inhibitors to make uh, the, the checkpoint inhibitors work better. And the idea you in, in, inject, uh, you get all kinds of chaos in the tumor, uh, and then because you also are messing with PD-1 and pd one or CTLA-4, uh, that you end up having more robust anti-tumor activity uh, in tumors. So how does this work? This is a phase one study of ipilimumab plus TVEC. Uh, again, small numbers, but doesn't look so bad, looks better than what you imagine ipilimumab would look like from a waterfall plot. Uh, and, the and the patients tend to do well, like you'd expect from ipilimumab. So maybe there's a little bit of magic here. Um, and a randomized trial ensued. And the randomized trial, uh, the response rate was the endpoint. There was twice as many responses in patients 
who are receiving the combination versus receiving ipilimumab by itself. Uh, however, uh, the progression-free survival was a little bit disappointing. And so despite the fact that you have better response rates, you don't necessarily have dramatically better progression-free survival. Uh, and this hasn't really taken off as a strategy in the front line for patients with metastatic melanoma. Um, pembrolizumab is a little bit more like it. Uh, we're thinking that that obviously has more effectiveness than ipilimumab. Um, and this trial looked at TVEC for about six weeks leading in, and then the combination would happen. Uh, very nice response rates, exceeding 60 percent. Again, single, single arm PFS and OS data for what it's worth looked good. More importantly, patients who you might not predict based on either pd one status or interferon score uh, were CR. So there are a lot of CRs. And, and this is, uh, and the y-axis is CD8 density. So a lot of complete responders that didn't have a ton of CD8 positive T-cells in the tumor at baseline. I mean, a lot of responders in generally, but these are CRs, there's a CR over here, of course. And so the idea that maybe some of these patients who you wouldn't predict the benefit from PD-1 inhibitor are benefiting when you give this in combination with, a, with an oncolytic virus. Um, in addition, uh, there definitely was an increase of CD8 density over time in both injected tumors and in non-injected tumors, particularly in the responders. So compelling data that's now led to a randomized phase three trial that was open, that enrolled, completed accrual, and now we're waiting to hear the results of pembrolizumab plus TVAC versus pembrolizumab in the frontline setting. In the next couple minutes, uh, I'll go through two final stories. One is focusing on PI3 kinase gamma inhibition. So um, we heard very briefly about that myeloid cells may be important and, and potentially even helpful for anti-tumor response, but most uh, of the myeloid cells that we tend to think about are, are actually suppressing um, outcomes. Uh, there is this so-called class of tumor-associated macrophages called M2 macrophages. There are also other myeloid cells called myeloid-derived suppressor cells, uh, which can clearly inhibit uh, anti-tumor activity in the tumor microenvironment. And it turns out that PA3 kinase seems to be important in the signaling of these cells. When you give a PA3 kinase inhibitor, at least, and uh, in, in specifically a gamma inhibitor to um, cells, uh, and, and ideally to mice who are, have a tumor, um, you end up seeing reversal of the subtypes from the, the uh, immune suppressive M2 class to the anti-tumor M1 class. And so there was a lot of excitement about inhibitors uh, of PI3 kinase gamma. Uh, and so this drug, which is called I, IPI549, is a pretty selective PI3 gamma inhibitor. When we did dose escalation, we probably could have pushed the dose up higher, but we had really good selection uh, against um, PI3 gamma. And so we didn't want to, we could have kind of gotten into delta and, and potentially alpha and beta uh, if we pushed the dose, but that wasn't the point. Um, this was a relatively well tolerated and single agent, uh, and then the combination. Uh, uh, was was uh, looked at in, in combination with nivolumab. Uh, a number of, of cohorts were open, and this was um, just looking at um, all comers in the dose escalation uh, of nivolumab plus IPI549. So a couple responders uh, and certainly many non-responders, and all of these um, were either patients who have an indication for a PD-1 inhibitor who had re previously received a PD-1 or pd one inhibitor, or indications where you wouldn't expect a ton of, of activity. Um, there is uh, some preliminary data presented at CITSI um, looking at this is the melanoma cohort. This so nine patients, one clear responder, a few other patients had some reduction of disease, some continuation of either stable disease or response, um, and across a number of different diseases, non-small cell lung, melanoma, head and neck, triple negative breast, a few responses. Uh, we're seeing uh, some stable disease. So this is being evaluated more uh, intensely in each of those uh, individual subgroups. But there may be in, in diseases or, sub, or, or solid tumors where you wouldn't expect great activity, some activity. Finally, I'll end with talking about HDAC inhibition. Um, so HDAC is, is 
an interesting target. It's, it's obviously a, a pretty important target for a lot of different um, intracellular um, mechanisms and, and, um, and function. Um, Intinistat, which is a class one selective HDAC inhibitor, um, has been shown in, in phase one testing to reduce circulating MDSC, uh, also uh, in, in murine models to, to end human cell uh, ex vivo analysis to look at to, it decreases MDSC and Treg function, um, and it's pro-inflammatory in the tumor microenvironment. Um, it's also uh, been shown that it can enhance antigen presentation. All of this is preclinical stuff and that there may be additional benefits on T effector cells and NK cells, uh, and in preclinical modeling showed synergy with anti-PD-1 antibody therapy. Encore 601 was the uh, phase one, two study of, of intinistat plus pembrolizumab. Um, and at AACR, uh, the presentation of the non-small cell lung cancer cohort uh, was was made, 76 patients enrolled, 73 were evaluable. Uh, the, the primary endpoint was response rate, and patients had to have had uh, prior PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitor, had to have had prior chemotherapy, and if they are EGFR or ALK um, mutated, they needed to have uh, anti-ALK or EGFR therapy. And what was seen is a response rate of 10 percent. That doesn't sound that awesome. Uh, but there was, these responders tended to hang around a while, so this is uh, weeks from last scan, so you're getting into over uh, a year in a, in a previously pretreated population. Um, and again, durable responses were seen in subsets of patients. Interestingly, they looked at baseline uh, classical monocyte populations in, in peripheral blood uh, and identified that if you had high levels of classical monocytes, um, that, that it seemed like most of the benefit uh, were in those patients. Um, the melanoma cohort was also presented at ACR. Um, similar concept, except obviously we don't have EGFR or ALK mutations. We have BRAF mutations, and so if patients had a BRAF uh, mutation, they had to have had BRAF-targeted therapy. Um, this uh, waterfall plot looks a little bit better than, than the non-small cell lung cancer done does. Uh, clear responses, about 20 percent of patients. Um, median duration of response was 13 months, and, and a number of patients had ongoing uh, responses at the time, or ongoing stable disease at the time of the data cutoff. Uh, and again, additional nine patients had stable disease that lasted for greater than six months in this previously pretreated population. Interestingly, we didn't see any effect on monocyte levels uh, being associated with benefit. Um, however, there was uh, some uh, RNA sequencing and, and, um, and, and uh, analysis available. And when looking at responders versus non-responders, uh, there were some hallmark pathways that were upregulated. Interestingly, TNF-alpha signaling, inflammatory response, epithelial mesenchymal trans. Um, and hypoxia myogenesis, um, E2F, G2M, uh, oxfos, fatty acid metabolism were associated with non-response. And when you treated patients uh, post-treatment versus pre-treatment and looked at the responders, uh, interestingly, the things that went down were the things that predicted non-response, and the things that went up were things that would predict response. I have no idea why EMT would be associated with response, but it was associated with response, and it was consistent. <laughs> Uh, it even went up in the responders. Interferon gamma makes more sense. Allograph rejection makes more sense. Uh, some of these others make more sense. But essentially, more inflamed tumors seemed, patients with more inflamed tumors seemed to do better even after they had progressed on PD-1 inhibitors with an inflamed tumor. Uh, interesting, uh, though I don't know um, what to make of that any more specifically. So in conclusion, we're definitely in the immune checkpoint inhibitor era, and everything we do is in the context of that statement. Yet a number of unmet needs exist. We have to have better predictive biomarkers. We need to better understand not just what the mechanisms are, but in an individual patient what their mechanism is, uh, and then develop more effective therapies based upon that. There's now randomized data with numerous combinations demonstrating improved outcomes with standard, in quotes, therapy, plus PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors, and encouraging data with the number of novel immune agents uh, in patients with previously progressed 
on PD-1 inhibitor therapy. I think I've run out of time, but I thank you for your attention. So I think we have time for one question. If uh, there's a burning question from, thank you very much, by the way, Ralph. That was an awesome talk. Burning question. There's one over there, yeah. Maybe you could use the microphone nearest you. Uh, can I ask a question about uh, the toxicity of combination therapy uh, with target therapy and the Im immunotherapy? Uh, do you observe it is specific to certain type of, uh, of pathway inhibition by the target therapy, or is it related to uh, other uh, pharmaco uh, or ki kinetic or pharm pharmacodynamic characteristics of the target therapy? It's a great question. Amazingly, the targeted therapy doesn't seem to be causing more immune-related adverse events. In fact, what we tend to see is that the immunotherapy augments the toxicity of the targeted therapy. So with dibrafenib and trametinib, you see more fevers, which you could argue could be immune, um, but you don't see more pneumonitis. You don't see more colitis. Um, you see some elevation of ALT and AST, but in the, in the, in the trial of um, them, Kobe and Atezo, when we saw uh, significant elevation of ALT and AST, uh, we didn't tend to see a very lymphocyte predominant um, liver biopsy. We saw what looked like a toxic necrosis, what you might see if you, got, if you took too much Tylenol. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's, I think for whatever reason, we're actually augmenting the toxicities of, of the targeted therapy as opposed to the immunotherapy. And, and I don't know, Justin, if it's a similar thing in, in lung cancer. And, and the other way I would think of it also, when we give PD-1 inhibitor therapy and stop and then give targeted therapy, the targeted therapy toxicities tend to be more prominent there as well. And you're, you're, obviously there's some carryover with an immune checkpoint inhibitor that's, that doesn't have a, a half-life of three hours. It sticks around a while and the effects do too. I would say in, in lung, we, we see the, the biggest toxins, hepatitis and uh, pneumonitis. Uh, it's hard to know. Right. Um, but, uh, and, and the pneumonitis risk certainly looks synergistic. So, for example, um, Osimertinib has about a 2% risk of pneumonitis. Derva, you know, 3 to 5. Together, 40%. So. Okay. Cool. Thank you.